Let's be sure to get a good look at what everybody is wearing. Who is more fashionable and who is less fashionable? I myself, as a bachelor, have recently been collecting clothes that uh, previously I would not have been allowed to wear. So what are we all wearing? Cain and Abel go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. The sacrifice of Abel is received by the Lord, but not that of Cain. Why? What did Cain do? What's wrong with Cain? Did he do the liturgy incorrectly? Did he offer the sacrifice wrong? Was it something that what he sacrificed? Now, people of a certain age, and certainly not pointing any fingers, remember the very old catechetical help from the 1940s that had a little drawing of how Cain's, the smoke of his sacrifice, went to the right and Abel's went up to heaven. Sorry, that's just the drawing. I've actually had people over the years say, well, his smoke didn't go up to heaven because they remember the picture. That was a very neat artist's rendering, not in the text. What exactly is wrong with Cain that his sacrifice is not received by the Lord, which sets up for all of what happens, the first murder on earth? What is the problem with the Pharisee praying in the temple? Thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men. Because certainly not like this tax collector over here. What's wrong with that? Oh, it's clearly wrong, but probably not for the reasons that we think. About a few weeks ago, maybe a month, I preached a very long sermon about the core of doctrine and why it matters. Because there's a hundred, a thousand seemingly little things. Our vestments, our liturgy, our music, the way things are presented, the way we present ourselves before the Lord, how we talk about God in Christ that seemingly are a bunch of small things or only semantics or only visuals. But really, if the core is correct, everything echoing out from that core must be a certain way. We don't have to ask questions like, should we do it Jesus' way or mine? Should we do it the way that makes me feel good or the way the Bible says it? None of those questions even come up if we have the core of everything right and it is the core that we're talking about. If we have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God in three persons, God in the flesh, truly incarnate, truly dead, truly resurrected, giving us this forgiveness of sins to no merit or worthiness in us, then everything else will line up. And hidden, or seemingly hidden, in the text, are the obvious facts of what has gone wrong in both of them. What did Cain do wrong? There's no specific word given that he didn't sacrifice the right thing or the right way or that he didn't say the right words. It's the core. The core is the problem, the faithless heart. The mystery as to why he is rejected and Abel is accepted is no mystery at all to God because God sees all and sees the heart. He sees what we're not able to see. It should be a mystery on the surface because we are not God. But the realization that we are not God then means what does God know? Only a short while after his sacrifice is rejected, out of jealousy for God of all things, Cain decides to murder his own brother. Do you think that two comic book panels ago, his heart was in the right place? Do you think seven or eight verses ago, he was a faithful man believing in the Lord God at the core like he should? That he suddenly resorts to the murder of his brother out of the blue, out of nothing because of... Of course not. The reason that his sacrifice is not accepted has nothing to do with what it is or how it's given, except that it is given from a faithless heart. Cain gives from a heart of one who is self-important, self-righteous, self-valuable, does not put his whole faith 
his hope, trust, and love in God above all things. He's already a corrupted, unbelieving heart. So God doesn't want his sacrifice. God will repeat this theme throughout the scripture. Particularly in the Old Testament, every time the Israelites sin against him by worshiping false gods, and then have the audacity to still go to his temple and burn the incense and offer the sacrifices and do the liturgy, God says, get away from my house. The stink of your sacrifices offends me. Not because they weren't doing it right. They were doing it wrong inside. It wasn't about the exterior things they were doing. It's that first comes faith, the core. When the core is right, everything else will fall into place. You will naturally do the things the right way. And doing the things the right way without the right core makes them irrelevant. Cain is a faithless man. That's why his sacrifice is rejected. He is exposed in the presence of God as being a faithless man. And all of God's love, the future, the promise of the Messiah that has already happened is suddenly then vested in Abel, is suddenly then invested in the one that is faithful and believes everything will hinge on him. Well, but not if I kill him, says Cain. I was the firstborn, says Cain. I should be the privileged one. His own mother thought that he was the Christ. We probably, or maybe, never caught that in the text. The first preaching of the gospel is in Genesis 3.15. God says a descendant of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And Adam and Eve believed God. We know that they did because they named their firstborn son Cain. And it says in the Hebrew what? It's a little bad in the English translation. She says, I have begotten a son who is the Lord not with the help of the Lord or by the Lord. Literally in Hebrew, I have a son who is God. That is what Eve says when Cain is born. Because she understood the promise of the Christ, she believed it, and nothing had ever happened before, like her being pregnant and delivering a child. Therefore, she concludes that it's Cain. We don't know what role this played in his childhood. We don't get this in the text. But Cain, who was believed to be the Messiah, is instead the first murderer, the one who kills his brother, his brother who is the ancestor of all the faithful by faith. He resorts to murder, not the chosen one for the gospel, but the chosen one for the proof that sin is hereditary. He got it from his parents. Original sin will be passed down. The children do not begin with an empty, clean slate. They begin corrupted by the pollution of their parents. What Cain did wrong was that he didn't believe. He didn't believe. He didn't place his faith, love, and trust in God above all things. Oh yes, he knew. He spoke to God. He knew that God was real. So what the demons in hell know that God is real but he did not have faith. This is where it goes wrong for Cain. God knew that he would be a murderer before he was. God knew the murder that was in the heart of Cain. God knew the faithlessness of Cain. That's why his sacrifices were not welcome. Now two men go up to the temple to pray. Thank you, God, that I am not like other men especially like this tax collector here. On the surface, this seems like one of the most obvious of all parables, isn't it? It even says it right in the gospel text in case we miss it. What does the writer put in for us? He told this parable against those who trusted, against those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. He tells us what the parable means. Ha! But it's not as obvious as we think. Thank you that I am not like other men. That's the first thing that resonates with us, isn't it? Wow, this guy is a jerk. But let's think about this for a second. How does he begin his prayer? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I am not like other men. 
thank you, God, that I am in a church and in a pulpit and not in a den of sin, dying of my addiction or my brutal lifestyle. Thank you, God, that you have made me like this and not like those who suffer. Is he really that wrong? He doesn't say, Lord, I am a great guy. I tithe, I give to the poor, I fast twice a week, therefore you ought to love me. He says, thank you, God, that you made me able to do these things. It's actually quite Lutheran of him. It's right from the Catechism. All good works come from the Lord. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I cannot believe in him without his grace. Thank you, God, for all that I have. Oh, this Pharisee is absolutely wrong, but he gets into the key of what is so troublesome with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are not that evil, except that what they miss. The Pharisees are right about, about 98% of doctrine and practice, believe it or not. The Pharisees are very close to the kingdom, we would say, and this is why Jesus is always giving them so much trouble. They're members of the church that have messed it up at the core. They've messed it up just enough that all this other stuff is so good. And then there's just this little, the Pharisee is absolutely right to go and pray. Thank you, Lord, for everything that I have and that I am. Thank you that I'm here offering you prayer because apart from you, I can't even do that. How blessed to be here. We sing this stuff in our hymns. How blessed it is to be here, O Lord, in your presence, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're here. What is it then that separates us from the Pharisee? What's he wrong about? He's not wrong to be thanking God for everything he has and everything he does. Paul would remind us, right? We are the new creations in Christ Jesus created for good works that he has planned in advance that we will do. All good works come from the Lord and are our destiny. Whatever he wants us to do, we will do. Thank you, Lord, for the good works that have come out of my existence. They weren't from me. They were from you. The Pharisee is right on the money. The problem is that first question. What's everybody wearing? Are you, are you dressed just right? Did you pick everything out? The parable of the wedding feast, where the king invites everyone and he gives them the white garment that covers all of their sin, metaphorically. And that guy that sneaks in that's not wearing one, the master of the feast says, how did you get in here? I was giving it away for free. What are you wearing? What all of us put on. We put on Christ in our baptism. We put on Christ in regeneration. We put on Christ by receiving his body and blood, no less into ourselves for our transfiguration, our transformation, our recreation. What we are wearing is the righteousness of God in Christ. That's going to look different for each of us at different points in our life. Paul was an enemy and persecutor of the church, a murderer of the faithful. He saw the risen Christ and became a believer. But if you had talked to Paul the day after he saw Jesus, what would his doctrine have been? How clear would it have been formulated in his mind? How well would his life be? Would it suddenly, miraculously be healed? We know that everywhere he went, everybody knew his reputation and said, how can our fellow Christians accept this man? Don't you know his evil and his wickedness? It takes a while. I was an adult convert. If you had questioned me about my doctrine the day after my conversion, you would not have called me a Christian. The day after my baptism, my way of life and lifestyle, you probably would have said I was not a Christian. Because that's the flaw when we judge those external things. The white robe is perfect in the eyes of Jesus Christ. But what we are is each at our own phase of existence. Salvation is a free gift, but the work that the Holy Spirit is leading us to do, to be what he is working us into, 
is at a different phase for every person. It's tailored to every individual. What the Pharisee does so horribly wrong, the reason he's trusting in himself, is that he turns to the tax collector in church next to him and judges him by what he's wearing. He says, thank you, God, for all the things you have made me. Thank you, you didn't make me like this bum over here. This is where he gets it wrong. Because at that core, even though he's praying the words correctly to begin with, what is in his heart, as what was in Cain's heart, is one who is jealous and hates his brother. He's jealous that the tax collector is allowed in the temple to pray, that one as miserable and wretched, wretched as that is allowed in the presence of God. God has made me this wonderful paragon of virtue, but then he allows in this filth. Where he gets it wrong is at that core. God is transforming every one of us all the time, constantly. And it's none of our business where anybody else is on that scale. It's none of our business how clean and tidy their uniform appears in this world. And the moment we start to judge one another by those things, instead of this core faith of doctrine that will lead to the transformation of all life, then we have gone astray. Then we're trusting in ourselves that we are maintaining the course so well, saying all the right words, doing all the right things with all the right people in all the right places. And the tax collector goes to his home justified instead because he's a miserable wreck for what he is and what he has done. He seeks more of the medicine of eternal life. The Pharisee gives it away. Yes, he prays rightly to thank God for what he has. But he didn't say anything about what he doesn't have. He didn't say, why don't I fast three times a week? Help me, O Lord. Why don't I tithe more? Help me, O Lord. Why am I still filled with sin and lust and covetousness? Help me, O Lord. The prayer of repentance and the seeking of the Lord is not there. He's got the first part, but the core, it's all in the words that he's saying. He doesn't mean it because the core of what is wrong in his heart gives it away. Jesus alone is the one that transforms. Jesus alone is the one that fixes Transfigures. Jesus alone dies for the sins of the world. Paul tells us again, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Dead. The dead are unable to fix their own condition. The dead are not able to get up and do good works by their own volition. The dead do not get up and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The dead are dead and they stay dead until they are resurrected. We were dead in our sins and transgression. The walking dead, the undead zombies of a sinful world, incapable of having real life until Jesus comes and finds us, until Jesus restores us, until Jesus fills us with new life. As he says himself, a spring of living waters welling up to eternal life. Jesus alone fixes, makes right, and Jesus alone knows where we are on the journey and where we're going to end up. In his name, amen.